Hello, good evening. Welcome to Noisy Thinking. Uh, I'm Sarah Newman. I'm the director of the APG. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. I'd like to say a few things in introduction before we start this evening. First of all, to say thank you as ever to Google for all of their support of the APG and uh, for letting us come to this beautiful space and for looking us after us so well with <coughs> fantastic olives and nuts and so on. We're very grateful for that. This evening is about making better sense of the world. And what we're planning to do is to give you at least 20 tools to help you do that. And I guess it's not just obviously for its own sake, but what we're all here about is uh, better and more interesting strategies. And one of the things we've noticed in the APG over the last you know, maybe five, six months is a lot of people saying to us, we need to find new places to go to search for insight and inspiration. And there's a sense that a lot of people are fishing in the same pool for stuff. And we need to find new pools, new lakes even, to find interesting stuff so that we can differentiate and, and make better solutions for our clients. So this evening, we've got a series of different disciplines, which are kind of adjacent to the central planning discipline, I guess. Um, and we've asked each of our speakers to give you some things that you can take away which are gonna really help you with your work tomorrow. We want noisy thinking to be inspirational and interesting, but above all, it has to be useful. You have to be able to use it um, to make your, your life and your work better. So it's going to be fast and furious. We've each asked each speaker, or uh, in fact, one speaker team, to do just 10 minutes. And they've got to do justice in that time for you know, the theory of what they're talking about and five amazing things to take away. So that's a really hard task we've set them. Well done, guys, for even attempting to come and do it. <coughs> so I hope you have lots of interesting stuff to take away at the end of it. And it is fast and furious. So there will be, I hope, lots of opportunity for you then to seek further into those disciplines and find out more, especially about stuff that you're not already very familiar with. Now, our partner in Noisy Thinking is an excellent research company. In fact, not just a research company, a global insights and strategy agency called Flamingo. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with them. And Flamingo specializes in cultural understanding. And one of the things it does is it has a series of specialisms manned by experts who look at the world in very different ways. And this evening, we are lucky enough to have two of those people to start off. And they are George Webster, who works in the Flamingo's Future team. And they use qualitative research, cultural trends, and brand strategy to help clients find fresh ways to understand how their business can play better in culture. Lucas Gallen is the head of the digital forensics team at, at Flamingo. And he, does, he has a wonderful thing that he does with his time. He says he constructs research projects, products, sorry, that combine the latest technologies with visual, brilliant visual design and he's obsessed with storytelling through data. So really interested in what he's got to say about that. After him, next up will be Chris Arning, who is the founder, of Sem of, founder and director of Creative Semiotics, who has written extensively on visual culture, and I think has just started his first novel. Is that right, Chris? And then Dr. Adam Gill, founder of Beyond Insights. Adam's going to talk about ethnography and how it can help solve complex problems. And finally, Alex Steer, who is Chief Product Officer at Wavemaker, was formerly the CSO at Maxis, and is an expert in data and analytics. So a lot of, a real range of different ways of thinking there, and we're going to crunch them all together in the next 40 minutes. So they're going to get up one after another, do their piece, and at the end, we're going to get them all on stage so that you can ask them lots of really, really hard questions. So without more ado, Flamingo. Sarah, sorry, which one's the, is this the, the master clicker? Yeah, I think, um, there you are. Yeah, all good. Cool, okay, so we are Flamingo, um, and my name, and where am I pointing this thing? Oh, here, there we go, we're good, excuse me. Um, my name is George Webster, and I am part of the Flamingo Futures team, um, and we specialize in trends and foresight, and really kind of understanding the direction in which culture is moving, with a particular view on today, I suppose, outlining some of the tools that we feel can speak to bigger approaches that you guys can take away and perhaps apply in your <laughs> daily work moving forward. Now, this image, you're probably thinking, wondering what the bloody hell this thing is. Well, our kind of furry friends here are a bacteria called Prevotella, which is a gut microbiome famed for its 
capability in improving physical performance. Now, we came across this gut microbiome doing a fascinating study exploring the future of well-being very recently. And uh, one of our LA-based participants at the kind of apex of well-being culture talked us through an activity she'd been engaging with, uh, something called poop doping. Poop doping is a very interesting activity and one that involves ingesting another individual's fecal matter into one's own system in order to improve physiological function. Now, you're probably thinking, why the hell is this guy talking about poo and bacteria? And is there a commercial application in it? Well, yes, there is. And I'd like to start by saying that we found this indicator, what we call an indicator of change at Flamingo through a really zoomed out approach. And this is one of our kind of first foundational principles of looking big, looking beyond brand, looking beyond category, looking across culture and picking up insights from semiotic practices, from the work that Lucas does, from the work that we do within the futures practice. But ultimately, it's about zooming out. Now, this is one indicator which sits at the top of this pyramid here. And this kind of will talk through the way we do trends at Flamingo. Now, take, for example, poop doping as one indicator. Now, if we just take the frame of well-being, we might think about some other indicators that we're constantly tracking. It might be the advances in plasma transfusion, taking the, the plasma from young individuals and injecting them into older individuals, that elixir of youth to rejuvenate individuals who are in their older years to supreme health, or the advances in grey matter technology, the, the possibility of improving cognitive functioning perhaps beyond our years. Now, there's a thread running here, and I think what we do at F Flamingo Futures, and I think this is something that you guys can take away, is, is really look at the, the thematic patterns that join the dots between these indicators. Look at the, the, what we would call the trend. Now, biohacking, of course, is one big thing here, but what we feel is perhaps slightly more interesting as a take is this idea of sustained optimization, which we would argue is perhaps moving away from an idea of managing our decline into ill health to inverting that curve perpetual betterment. And ultimately, what we feel is important to, to acknowledge are the driving forces that basically give rise to this trend. Now, these could be kind of numerous, but to pull two out and to give you a sense of how this pyramid really is fully structured, one might be the cult of the individual, the doctrine of individualism that's kind of very much pervasive in society today, or the idea of self-quantification, the fact that we are constantly able to consciously track every heartbeat, every movement, and the, the ideas of limitless potential, of optimization, of improving our lives ever more that arises from that. But ultimately, I think what's really, really incredibly rich about the work we do at Futures within the broader context, context of Flamingo is when we partner with individuals like Lucas within his practice of digital forensics. Lucas's work could get us through his linguistic modeling and his digital tracking, which he'll talk you through, could get us to that poop doping indicator. Or it could allow us to explore the idea of sustained optimization even deeper. But ultimately, it allows us to do a number of things really, which gives really rich and deep insight. One, a sense of size and scale of something like sustained optimization. And two, a sense of whether or not it's something is growing or shrinking. And three, whether or not such a phenomenon is actually related to and, and talking to behavior that's actually happening and being talked about online. So to hand over to Lucas. Thank you. Um, five minutes is a very short time to talk about all of this stuff, but I do want to say that George picked the topic, not me. Um, <laughs> so basically, we're going to talk about tools, and that's all very good, but the first thing that we must realize as analysts is that no tool is going to come and save the day, right? Like that ultimately there is no replacement, no amount of technology is ever going to substitute you know, forward thinking and actually humility about the data that we handle. So that's very important. Uh, the other thing that I kind of want to say is basically that, well, yeah, five minutes is not going to be enough. So we're going to talk about <laughs> linguistic modeling and digital tracking. Uh, linguistic modeling is really something that came along has been around for a long time. It's really the processing of large amounts of data, uh, human language data, into uh, something that a human can process. I remember during the early 2000s, I worked a lot with clients who were getting into the dashboard game and very quickly realized that uh, you, know, you were just seeing 
I got 10,000 tweets and I have 15,000 tweets. What's the meaning of that? And it's quite a lot of paralysis that comes from such large uh, amounts of data. Uh, what we need to start doing is building tools that allow us to structure that data and actually make some sense of it. Uh, so for my sense, I'm going to try a live demo here uh, of some of this stuff, but in the context of poop doping. So what we have here is a linguistic model of runners. Uh, it's basically about five million conversations over time. And um, I've mixed in some of the data, but what it shows you is that algorithmically we can start seeing some of the patterns in the way that runners might speak. Here in the middle, every single one of these spheres represents a concept that they're talking about. So they talk about the location that they run, or very soberingly, they talk about temperature. And we can see the pattern of heat, for example, every summer, you know, every runner is like, it's very hot, and every winter it's like, it's very cold. It's a sobering thought. Um, we can see, you know, over here um, what kind of apparel they talk about, you know, it's not surprising to see Adidas or Asics, right? And we might be navigating this and find ourselves within the medical cluster, see the types of injuries that they come upon, and find things like biohacking, and see that in the last year biohacking is particularly hot, and eventually even come across the concept of poop doping. Uh, I should say that it's such a novel concept that you've come up with that it was kind of difficult. There were only so many conversations, but typical to the internet, you have that balance of like people going like, I want to learn what poop doping is, and then people saying, I hate you, kill yourself. So I've tried to um, <laughs> sort of limit it as best as possible. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk to you guys uh, is digital tracking. Um, I've done a lot of work both with companies that rely heavily on algorithmic prediction of human behavior and sort of there's always that feeling that you're not fully understanding what humans are doing and then I've done some qual work in the past and I always wanted a little bit more of, out of truth a little bit more of an approach about the underlying volition and process and rationale by which people make decisions and today we can layer technology over practices that are still incredibly relevant no one's saying that qualitative research or human understanding is is no longer valuable but we can add a layer of data in order to understand them a bit better um, so what we do in Flamingo is we combine these methods, right? So we have our prompted research where you're directly asking someone, how do you feel about this? Ethnography, which is self-reported behavior. We might ask someone to keep a diary every time they wash their hair. What product did they use? I don't know why it went with that. I have no hair, but yes. And then uh, digital tracking, which is really the act of uh, tracking someone through their digital devices. Now, this is anonymized fake data that I've spliced together, but this might be a runner that we're looking at. Uh, we can see through their tracking data where they go. We can even see that they listen to iTunes on their commute, right? So you can see it highlighted there in green. And for every commute, it lights up in red. You can see them like going to work and coming back. And we say to ourselves, well, how are they tracking their running? You see Strata here. They use it quite a lot of time. And then there's a block of Strata followed by some internet searching. So maybe this person was like, I want to be better. I'm might need to do some poop doping. I don't, I don't know. Uh, and we can see what sort of searches that is. That's a search for biohacking. And then they might even come across this spike over here of TED.com uh, conversation, right? And we can see how that might lead them to a conversation by Ellen Jorgensen about you know, biohacking. So again, by getting very close to a human's data and really understanding that additional to the kind of questions that we might ask, uh, we can get very close indeed. Uh, to understanding something and even something as abstract as the concept that George has picked. So yeah, thank you. That's it in five minutes. So uh, yeah, I, ultimately that's a bit of a kind of a whistle-stop tour, so to speak, of how our two specialisms can come together. But I think there's some key tools or approaches that you guys might kind of take away from this. One, zooming in. Looking at these kind of micro indicators that are kind of signals of cultural change and analyzing them in a really kind of deep way. But in order to get to them, zooming out, thinking big and thinking really expansively about what is going on in the world. Cultural change happens from absolutely everywhere. Linguistic modeling, of course, that Lucas has talked through, the ability to look at kind of the conversation happening online, the associations of linguistic concepts, and then applying a, an understanding, a layer of cultural meaning on top of that. Digital tracking, understanding behavior being exhibited in real time and understanding the meaning of, of why people are doing the things that they're doing. But ultimately, it's how all of these things come together that is, we feel is kind of the richest way that, that Flamingo can deliver cultural insight. So thank you.
Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the um, APG's Noisy Thinking event. I'm Chris Arning. I'm founder and director of a company called Creative Semiotics. Um, it's great to be here. Just by way of introduction, I'm a creative strategist and creative problem solver, and I work with brands such as the BBC, Netflix, GSK, and Unilever. And my new website's going live by the end of the week, so that's the first tool for you, shameless self-promotion. Um, <laughs> So hands up, who's heard of semiotics? Okay, I thought it was just gonna be my girlfriend, that's a relief. <laughs> who's worked with semiotics? Okay, there's a few more, can make a small village out of that. Um, well, I think we know something about semiotics. Here's a meme here. Um, now, semiotics can be confusing for people. It's a word that isn't familiar. Um, it is something that get, requires getting to grips with. But my point is that semiotics can be, doesn't have to be confusing. It doesn't have to be baffling. It can be really useful. Um, semiotics, for me, is just a way of making explicit what we all do naturally and making the um, invisible visible. And I believe it's a, a, an essential tool to have in the planner's arsenal, along with behavioral economics, neuroscience, neuromarketing, some of the other tools that the Flamingo guys were mentioning just now. So semiotics can also be a bit more like this. It can be thrilling, it can give you insights and epiphanies about your business and about how you move forward with your brand. So what I'm tasked with doing today is to share four tools from my perspective that can help us understand the world in 2018. Um, so I'd better get on with it, I've only have a few minutes. So in terms of my four tools, I split them into four. Um, I thought these might be useful for planners. So the first one is about binary opposites, and really that's just one of the ways that a semiotician would look at the world in terms of opposites and binary pairs. Then we're going to be talking about something to do with cultural capital, which is how we use signals to signify things about our social status. Thirdly, we're going to go through something to do with music and how music can create meaning and how we can understand that. And then the fourth is more like a, what we call a life hack. So it's something that can help improve your life and help improve do what you do as a job. So first, binary oppositions. Um, binary opposites is the implicit cultural system by which two inherent opposites are set off against one another. So we only know clean because we understand dirty. We only understand processed food because we understand the framework of fresh. You know, kettle chips make sense in terms of packaging because we've seen walkers and there's glossy versus matte. So semiotic thought suggests the real understanding of anything <laughs> comes from knowing what it's not rather than what it is. But not everything in black and white makes sense. Great segue. Um, <laughs> Brand values presuppose their binary opposite, which is essential in communication. So brands and categories work implicitly on binary opposition. So diesel versus Levi's, Pepsi versus Coke. But even within a brand, this brand is built on a profound binary oppositions. We have the metaphor of black and white for the dark and light of the products. We have the surge and the settle to dramatize the way the product is. But also we have the single maverick Guinness drinker against the superficial colorful world of lager. And that's something that the Guinness has traded upon for years is arguably. When I worked on VW, their problem was being too understated. And what we found out from the semiotics was actually undercutting the desire of the product. They always said implicitly in their advertising, we're not flashy, we're not BMW, we're not a large American car, we're not an unreliable Italian car. But actually, what are you? And that was what they were never really talking about through their English understatement. Um, just another one, and so just, just to give you a cl clarity on that, so the metaphor, obviously, the pinstripe versus the leopard skin, a class distinction, another binary opposite. Less happily, we can see quite the sort of quite vicious, melanin-obliterating whiteness advertising. It draws its force not only from Christian spiritual imagery, but also from the hidden blackness that we cannot see, but that is implicit re implicitly referenced through the ideology of the advertising, predicated, of course, on the social norm that dark skin is undesirable. Now, Lack of diversity and, frankly, the elevation of skin lightening to a social norm has obviously hit a backlash recently. So we see skincare brands started by people of colour, for people of colour, like Rihanna's Fenty or Epara, as I've shown here, um, challenging the big brands who have obviously more belatedly started integrating people of colour into their advertising and produce ranges for, of, of different shades for people of colour, rather belatedly. But just to summarise a way of looking at binary oppositions, if we see... Um, we think about the skincare market in terms of two batches, the old skincare and the new skincare, which I recently produced on a project. So the old skincare works on mass media, the new skincare is more about blogs and social media, the old skincare works through patriarchy, 
the new skincare is more of a matriarchy and there's less kind of body shaming and the beauty myth is very much soft pedaled in the new skincare, which is not to say they're not saying you should look desirable, but there's a kind of an ideology of toning that down. And all the other things which I'm not going to go, go through, but I guess you'll get these slides after the presentation. So on to the next tool. I couldn't speak about semiotics without mentioning culture. And culture is neither just what we do around here or what we tend to do in this country, neither is it highbrow culture like opera or art. It's actually just the signs and symbols we use to communicate with each other. So we can come on to the idea of cultural capital. A cultural capital consists of the social assets of a person that promotes social mobility in a stratified society, or as Grayson Perry calls it, on social media, gaining brownie points from your friends from posting a meme or, or, or photos from an art exhibition. Now, what I'm really interested in at the moment in terms of cultural capital is the surfeit of kitsch. Um, so kitsch is a sort of, um, sort of form of art which is arguably about uh, lack of soul, lack of meaning, and obviously an, 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 an often an ironic stance. Um, so Lady Gaga isn't the only one to sort of jump on the Jeff Koons bandwagon. Jeff Koons is an artist who produces a lot of kitsch. Saw this piece of work in an art gallery in uh, Latimer Road and it felt very uh, opposite to what's happening a lot in advertising at the moment. So many brands have used kitsch as a design strategy from Machino to Beauty Couture to Gucci, to Gucci. And most recently Gucci used Jeff Koons as part of their latest campaign. Um, and I think it's been successful partly because it is a luxury brand speaking the language of youth. And that's something that uh, Gucci have done very well. Um, just in terms of um, kitsch, we can also find it through the appropriation of meme culture that Lenovo show in this ad. And if you've seen their yoga, yoga ad, it's kind of a spoof of meme culture and, um, and sort of incongruous juxtaposition and randomness. That's also part of this, this same sort of general love of kitsch and cultural appropriation. Um, we couldn't also talk about this area without talking about unicorns, because the unicorn is a very uh, ubiquitous entity at the moment. Um, the sort of, um, they are everywhere. You can get unicorn glow, have unicorn toast with your unicorn frappuccino, um, and even drink unicorn gin liquor, as seen in this advertising. Um, so we have a surfeit of kitsch, and people are using um, kitsch as a way of signifying the fact that they're in touch with the cultural zeitgeist on social media. And this is something that obviously brands are also appropriating. So in this ad, you have eBay challenging a gay user to deck out their Ford Mustang in a Rainbow Alliance colors and a unicorn through, purely through eBay purchases, which is obviously a great coup for eBay. And she then drove it through uh, along a, a gay pride rally with her mum. So that was a kind of real, real coup for eBay. Um, it's obviously also been appropriated by brands like lastminute.com, this whole de idea of pinkification. Um, there is a, a large degree of appropriation of LGBT and queer codes in this, of course. There is the sort of internet culture, there is nostalgia for the 90s, and just a kind of a general love of colour and display. The third tool is about music, and I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. Um, Music is an emotional language. It can help regulate our mood, improves likability and mem memorability of communication, but it's often ill-used in branding. Usually branding, um, ab ab sort of advertising uses music as an afterthought um, in terms of um, uh, producing advertising. Um, and I think that's a real shame, because I think strategic use of music can really improve the power and effectiveness of communication. Um, in a famous study, they piped German and French music through supermarket aisles. And while they were piping French music through the aisle, um, there was a correlation of 77% of those individuals during that period were buying French wine. And when they were playing German wine, 73% of those people bought German wine. And when asked on a self-report after the period had finished, none of the participants could remember hearing any music. So that, I think, is a great example of the power of music. So Radio Centre commissioned um, me, Creative Semiotics, and a team of, of neuroscientists to think about how to choose the right piece of music um, for advertising. And they gave us the 24 most popular words that planners were given in creative briefs, um, which you can see, you may have seen some of these before. And um, we were asked to look through a vast amount of music, listen to a, a thousands of tracks, literally, and we whittled it, um, the tracks down to 120 tracks five for each of these pieces of music. Then we were challenged to say, 
well, how does each piece of music have meaning? Um, these were the parameters we came, through, came, came out with, um, which have, been, have a lot of credence in the literature. And they are on display on a tool called the Brand Music Navigator, which you can find online. And I will be sharing the link with you in the presentation. It's a tool to help choose music in advertising. Um, I do have one final tool, which is about mindfulness um, and staying woke. But I will include that in the presentation when I send it through to you, because my time is up. Thank you very much. Wow, really inspiring talk. Uh, speakers before me, that's great. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be here. Uh, my name's Adam Gill, and I'm founder of Beyond Insights. Uh, we're an ethnography organization. We've heard a little bit about ethnography in the previous speakers. But before I do, I just want to kind of get a quick um, test going with you guys. Who here is nosy as fuck? Two, OK, that's, that's a few, all right. Um, who here uh, likes gossip? OK, how many people are on social media? Point proven. Okay, so uh, I would just like to introduce ethnography today uh, as a way of making uh, sense of a complex world and then run through five tools and ways of thinking because I'm really interested in the difference between what people say and what they do. That's what my test was about if you didn't already get it. So Beyond Insights are a deep human insights agency and we exist to make sense of complex lives of humans for brands and agencies and our primary focus is ethnographic insights. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit through this as a kind of a story. Oh, my slides are there, great. Um, and explain a little bit about why I'm really interested in this as a topic, because for me, uh, having started Beyond Insights, it kind of, it was my passion, really. It was, it was something that, as a kid, I was really fascinated by people. I was always around on my bike, asking people what they were doing and why they were doing it, annoying people in the community and saying, you know, what are you up to and why are you doing that? And, you know, that really still makes me tick, frankly. Um, I'm really interested, again, you know, into understanding what r people are really like behind the kind of curated life of Instagram in an honest sense. So uh, my story took me off to university. I went to study popular music studies because I thought that would be the answer to find out why people do what they did. It wasn't. They kicked me out. I went to do politics, which eventually took me here, which was uh, the 2006 uh, socialist revolution of Bolivarianism in Venezuela. Um, I was there to understand how people uh, participated and, and what made them tick in political terms, both pro and anti uh, Chavez, which is the president then. Um, I noticed quite quickly there's quite a bit of tension uh, going on. Uh, and I, when I arrived, th this was a riot not too far from where, where I was at, and pretty frequent to see that. Um, and what I realized uh, that my first insight from my research really was that this is not going to be an easy place for a gringo. But but what I did learn in this space, in this tense political space, was how different cultures could be and the importance of that and how hard it can be for people to really trust you. Um, people ever thought I was James Bond or more likely Mr. Bean. Uh, it wasn't until I gained access to certain communities by burning my hand in a fire ceremony that I eventually got to start my research, uh, being in people's homes and being invited to more parties, strangely. Um, so what is ethnography? Basically, ethnography is the study of the lived experience of people, uh, revealing rituals, complexities, contradictions. They're often interwoven. And I then make it simple to understand. I unlock motivations, behaviors, and desires to understand what was not readily visible and to then generate insights to drive things like campaigns or brand strategies. What sorts of tools would I use as an ethnographer? Well, first of all, I would go to the location of the place being researched, be it here or abroad or some, you know, wherever it is, and get a sense for the cultures and activities and what are people doing, how does it feel, smell, look like. Um, and then I'd start to refine my research proposal uh, into a kind of an observational phase in which I'd uh, follow participants. Uh, hopefully, they'll invite me into their activities, as I previously mentioned. Um, and, and I get to see what they're doing and try to understand why. But I won't know why, because I'm not them. So I follow up with interviews and delve into their motivations uh, over a period of time to understand really what it is that they say they do and what they actually do and what I saw in observation. Start to understand the strands through all of that. I can develop some case studies as a result of that, often in binaries, as we've already heard about binaries, to understand what people do over here and what people do over here to generate the key trends and insights that we probably didn't know already. 
I also use online ethnography so we can record our lived experience using our phones and document where we are and what we think. You can look inside of our fridges and go down shopping aisles and say this is what's cool and this is what's not so cool. So the combined uh, process cleans, you know, pretty massive insight nuggets really. And I, I really, really fucking love ethnography. Um, basically, that's why I do it. Um, I really love understanding why people do what they do or don't do or, or whatever. And, and you know, the reason I love it is because humans are, are complex and simple. They're uh, shocking and exciting and beautiful and messy. I think that to be invited into people's homes, to be able to learn about them is an absolute gift. And, uh, and to get to immerse and blend into new cultural experiences is something that I, I feel very lucky to do. Um, people show me who they really are. Um, sometimes it's harrowing. I remember <clears throat> being in a deep southern state in America in a McDonald's. Um, interviewing somebody uh, who had diabetes about healthy eating whilst he poured uh, uh, syrup over his big breakfast and put eight creamers in his coffee and he told me how he'd lost his leg due to diabetes. Um, that's, that told me two insights. Um, one, don't trust recruitment companies, they just want the money. And two, people aren't always truly aware um, as to what they are telling you as to according to what you're observing about them. So it's really interesting for me to, to synthesize you know, the data that I've received from uh, notebooks and photos and recordings and films into tangible, actionable insights. So much of the uh, research that I've done in the commercial space has to do with desire. What choices and decisions do people make and what makes people smile? Like the time that I ask people when they most like to eat certain products, what kind of meal times did they like? And they lit up when they mention family meal times and special occasions. It's those interactions that we can't see through survey data, potentially. This often leads to replicating this sense of desire and ritual where it isn't there yet in, in, in things like products and campaigns. I remember interviewing people about messaging apps and how creeped out they felt about targeted ads and what I quickly realised is that people are really happy to swap privacy for something for free. Um, I remember being in the Basque country more recently um, researching shopper behaviour for the local government who wanted to understand how to enhance their e-commerce platform. And the one thing that stood out was within the culture for the Basque people was that their customer service targets was, um, approach is so important and ingrained in the community that e-commerce e e e had to abs absolutely up its game if it was going to try and match anything like the local shopping experience. One of the most heartwarming examples that I've got is, uh, and still today, is uh, some, some research that I did with the NHS with patients with dementia, um, where I was invited as a participant observ ob observant person into gym and flower arranging and um, choir practice and barbecues. And what I noticed was that the carers who looked after people with dementia um, were, were being supported to the point that when they received kindness, they wanted to volunteer back. And that ended up saving the NHS thousands upon save, thousands of pounds because um, they, they were engaged and involved in something that actually changed. So what does it all mean at the end of the day? <clears throat> Aware of time. Um, when people feel listened to, connected with and part of something, that connection produces something that people really want to be part of. And that is the difference between a good and a great campaign. So I promised five tools today. Um, so the first one is, I don't have it on me, right? I was going to pull out the notebook and go take a notebook everywhere. <laughs> Didn't work, so I haven't got it. It's my bag, fuck's sake, right. <laughs> However, when you've got your notebook, imagine the notebook. Uh, just, I think it's really important to just take notice of the world around you and what is, you know, what, what do you see, what do you notice, what disturbs you, what, what, kind of, what kind of things do you feel when you're in these different environments? Because for me, um, you know, if you felt it, it's likely that someone else will feel it too, and it's that connection that will generate really great uh, copy and content and so on. Get culture shocked more often. I tried this um, over New Year's this year when I went to the Faroe Islands. My first insight was don't go to the Faroe Islands in winter. It's not the best place, but that said, do, do immerse in new environments. It's where the magic happens, for sure. It's where we get to see our own culture from a different lens and realise what's going on around us. Um, I think that you know, um, being culture shocked kind of helps us get outside of our comfort zone, and really, you know, nothing good, nothing good comes from a comfort zone. Let's be honest. Um, observe more. Be out and about. I, I like to stop when I'm out and about, take my earphones out and listen. I, like to, I love to eavesdrop and hear people's arguments, especially on tube. You know, I love to sit next to people on the bench while they're on their phone. I love to just watch what people are up to. It's great. I get paid to people watch. Take a different route home. Use your bike, walk, and while you're doing all this, take more photos because 
If you take photos of the emotions that you're experiencing at the time, you can look back at them at random. The best ideas really come from random inspiration. When you're out and about, absolutely hands down, you've got to speak to more people because people are our source of ideas, connection, love and inspiration. Ask them about them. Never assume you know anything. There's always something to learn. Ask the guy on the train or the woman on the street. Everyday connections glean the biggest insights because, you know, why they do what they do. And this inspired me more recently to generate a creative uh, project. Having move, uh, moved recently to London, um, I'm, I'm uh, producing interviews, <coughs> ethnographic interviews, short ones for social media. Um, about the movers and the shakers and the doers. So if you've got any ideas, come talk to me at the end and do definitely follow at Beyond Insights Co. I'm going to leave you with a video and it's not quite the end, but the video is a minute and a half, so I'm going to stand here awkwardly while you watch it. Please play the video. The average cow passes enough wind in a week to inflate a hot air balloon. Eighty-eight percent of clowns never fall in love. Thirty-six percent of strippers had a convent education. Every year, over 300 animals escape from zoos and circuses. of Man United fans have never been to Old Trafford. Forty-four percent of Ku Klux Klan members were delivered by a black nurse. Men think about sex every six seconds. So for me, that advert perfectly... Uh, can we click to the next slide? Um, that advert perfectly conjures up everything that I've spoken about for me. I think that it um, conjures up adverts so fucking brilliantly. Um, I have a final slide with some contact details on that's just not there, but um, I just wanted to say that I'm running some workshops in May, if anyone wants to know about it, come and find me later. Um, I really want to see that last slide. Yes. <laughs> Big data can't see, but human data sees beyond. Thanks very much. Hello. Uh, I'm Alex. Uh, you've seen half of my slides anyway. Um, I'm, a uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a data person, but um, I thought I should start with a bit of a content warning because we've seen some amazing stuff. We've seen, you know, kind of uh, deep ethnography. We've seen semiotics. We've seen futures thinking. Lucas has built the matrix. Uh, I said I'm gonna t I said I'm going to talk about data. They said you can go on at the end. Um, the, uh, it's going to be pretty dry uh, in comparison. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to lie, uh, it's a bit specky, um, but it may contain five things that will help you defend great work. Um, so, look, and I'm from a media agency, the, the, the people who bought you this, uh, and the people that tell you that your ads need to be five seconds long or less or nobody will see them. Uh, and uh, I'm a data person in a media agency, so this, it's now the, officially the most evil job in the world, uh, which it wasn't when I agreed to do this. So I'm effectively this guy. So hello. Um, uh, and, but look, also, I said I'd talk about data, um, but who here hasn't been to enough data presentations? Thank you. Uh, look, there's, there's, a kind of, there's, there's two golden rules of data presentations. First is they have to contain in this slide. Um, uh, over which someone normally says data is the new oil or, or something like that. And, but data is mainly ones and zeros. And this one, these ones are back to front and they come in a tunnel. Um, uh, and then you have to show this slide uh, <laughs> in a way to the, 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 about how technology is kind of inspiring change as if this is what inspiration looks like. Um, so, I, so look, I, I thought, rather than talk about data, given that the bar is set so low, I'm going to go double or quits 
and talk about maths. Um, <laughs> because math, at least we can agree on maths. Uh, maths is hard. Maths, as advertising people, makes us feel like the machines have won. And increasingly, maths is used by people of dubious virtue to make you feel stupid and to make you feel like they're clever. There he is again, with maths, evil <laughs> and maths, together. Thank you for making my life inestimably harder than it, than it had to be. Um, but mainly, I wanted to talk about maths because there's no shortage of people talking about data. Um, but actually, I think there is a shortage of people talking about the the underlying maths of what we do, the underlying maths of advertising. And I thought as a counterpoint to everything else today, which looks at how we can be more specific, more personal, deeper, more one-to-one, -one, more human, I talk about the really big, boring mathematical patterns that we see in advertising that I think planners a generation or so ago used to know a lot better than we do. I think data has unlocked a lot of new worlds, but I think there are a, lot of, a few lost arts from a world where you had to understand the underlying shape of the maths of what we do, because there wasn't anything else. You were making your decisions as a planner more on research data that was often a fairly small volume, the odd kind of panel study, the odd scanner study, but nothing like the volume of data that we've got today. And actually, when we have slightly less data, that can make us more attuned to the underlying patterns. So. What I thought I'd try and do for the, the, the next six minutes and 47 seconds is give a quick uh, primer on five things in the subject of how to talk about maths and sort of sound like you know what you're talking about a bit. Um, I'm going to do that via the means of five wiggly lines, which are my five tools. Uh, this one uh, is called the cumulative binomial distribution. I did say it would be dry. Um, <laughs> you, you, you had your chance. Uh, the cumulative binomial distribution or its friend, the, the exponential distribution. Uh, this is generally the pattern you see when you're looking at how many people will see my ads. So if you start at spending nothing over here, nobody sees your ads. Uh, if you're spending in digital, that can continue to be the case for a while. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, Google. Um, if you, you know, as you go over here, you spend more, but with each extra pound you get in, you get slightly less reach. It's also the, uh, the sales response that you get from advertising as well. For every extra pound that you put into advertising, you get extra sales, but fewer extra, if that's the phrase I'm looking for. Um, so number one. Number two, the beta distribution. Um, slightly less well known, uh, loads of fun. This, descri this describes uh, really well the distribution of things like how much time people spend using media. If you go, again, uh, over here, the heaviest people in terms of media usage, um, <laughs> although, um, and, and the lightest ones over here, most of us are kind of, you know, here, not quite in the middle. Uh, there are relatively few very, very heavy media users. Most of us are kind of in the middle. And when we talk about the long tail of light uh, users of any channel, TV, radio, press, newspapers, outdoor, that sort of thing, they live over here. So beta distribution, good for understanding those people. Um, third, uh, the, 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 the negative binomial or the power law distribution. Um, this is the winner takes most distribution. If you have read How Brands Grow, if you know kind of Byron Sharp, uh, you'll be kind of fam intimately familiar with this. Uh, this describes things like how many times people buy my brand. If I buy your brand once a year is over here, and I buy your brand every day is over here, most of us are up there. Um, it also, patterns like this normally kind of describe how uh, loyalty effects or kind of brand market share effects kind of build in a, build in a population as well. There, you tend to get a very few number of players with a lot of wins and a long tail. When we talk about the long tail, that's the long tail. Um, this one's an S-curve, the uh, clues in the name. Um, it describes how trends build uh, in a population, particularly over time. Uh, it does a really, really good job of that. Basically, things start slowly, then they get faster, then you run out of people who haven't done them. So you, you, know, uh, you, you, you look at th uh, things like technology adoption over time. Um, that's what that looks like. If you stick three of these on top of each other, you've got the Three Horizons model, and you're very clever, and you can go and work for McKinsey. Uh, <laughs> if you want. Uh, and lastly, the normal distribution. It's called the normal distribution because it's everywhere, um, and it looks a bit rude. Uh, this, you know, this is a good model for all sorts of things. The heights of people in this room are probably normally distributed. Your commutes here were probably normally distributed. Most of you are somewhere in the middle. The peak is the average. Um, it also roughly describes how well most ads work, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about in a second. Um, 
you've been very patient while I've been doing this, this kind of dry math stuff, and often people get a bit annoyed with the underlying maths of advertising or feel like it's taking away something from our discipline and, and, and from how we work. Because all of us, as planners, as creative people, as people who care about what we do, want to beat the odds. We want to be better than the average. We don't want to feel like the work that we do conforms to a pattern. But I think in order to beat the odds, you've got to know the odds. You've got to know the odds of doing something extraordinary. You've got to know that they're stacked against you. Uh, and you've got to be able to take other people on that journey with you. Let's go back to the normal distribution. You want your ad to be here. There are loads and loads of ads that are OK in terms of their, you know, the, the sales response or the effectiveness response you get from them. There are a few really bad ones. There's a few really good ones. You want to be up here winning awards, being famous, being in Cannes, uh, winning at the IPA, uh, that kind of thing. It's not easy to do, and it's not easy to sell. Work that lives up here is disproportionately hard to sell, which is probably why most ads kind of end up here in the middle of the normal distribution. The reason I've shown you these five wiggly lines is A, I wanted to bore you with some maths, but B, actually I feel like these are a good kit for you to have as planners as a defense mechanism against ending up in the middle. And here's why. You can use each of these to make an argument for not doing boring, bland, forgettable work. Because when it comes to ads, most are average. They follow the normal distribution. When it comes to the people who look at your ads or your campaigns, lots of them are light. Most people aren't paying a huge amount of attention. When it comes to the results that you get from your advertising, when it, you know, it comes from the market that you operate in, most gains are unequal. Most markets, to some extent, are winner takes all or winner takes most. When it comes to your media strategies or your sales strategies, headroom is limited. It's very easy to do the same thing again and again and hope that you will continue to get the same results. Mathematically, you won't. And lastly, the S-curve. It's a reminder that change takes time. If you're trying to challenge any of these other things or challenge your client's position on any of these curves, which is really what you're doing when you're doing advertising, you have to recognize that there's an investment in changing conversations, in changing perceptions, in changing culture that takes time. So five wiggly lines, five tools. And the reason I show them is because they speak back to something that you don't need me to tell you, which is that great work is worth fighting for. We want to fight for it as planners. It's our job as, as planners to fight for it. What I hope these five things do, in some ways, when you're talking to people who don't have the natural instinct for it that you might have, is give you some tools that you can use to start fighting with. That's it. Thank you very much. Well, I, I promised a whistle-stop tour, and that certainly was fast and furious. And thank you all. You know, the content was incredibly interesting and very diverse. But I think what struck me more than anything else was the absolute passion that they all had for their subject. And I think that's something that we can take away with us. And I, I think your immense curiosity to understand more and to communicate was, was brilliant. But I'm sure that you have questions beyond Chris just telling us a little bit more about Woke, since you didn't have a chance, in brief. Um, well, the, yeah, it's, it's a big, big topic. I'll do my best to be brief. I mean, woke as a term, obviously coming over from the States, has been associated with um, being aware of manipulation, ideology, um, being aware of some of the bad things happening in the world, being more socially conscious. But I think the other facet to it that we're not maybe aware enough about is the sort of the evaporating interface between our brains and devices. And if we've got, for example, I went to a, a trend talk recently, something called subconscious commerce. If you go to an Amazon store now in the States and plants, you can just walk out with your goods. Now, if we've, if we've got companies enabling things to become easier and easier, do we not need to become more aware of the way we make decisions? So I think wokeness is also about understanding our technology and understanding how we're being influenced, things like dopamine loops, things like, um, being locked into sort of you know networks, so obviously great to be in Google here today, and it's very very appropriate thing to be saying. I'm obviously going to be going to be assassinated by the drone on my way home this evening, but um, yeah, I mean there's more to say, but it is in my presentation, which I guess you guys will get at the end. Oh yep, yep, great. Um, she's made me stand up. 
<laughs> when actually I was just wondering um, if you asked any ladies to participate this evening and they turned you down. That's absolutely a brilliant point and I didn't know whether to mention it myself when I did the introduction at the beginning of the evening. What happened was we had a lineup which included a more diverse number of people and unfortunately a couple of them weren't able to do it. So we have the lineup I think of wonderful speakers but absolutely recognise that um, they're not very diverse in lots of ways. I would also like to say that... <laughs> I mean, I'm middle class, but, you know, public school educated, but come on, you know. Can I just finish on that? And on a number of occasions here and in other venues, we've had lineups of all female speakers and we've had ethnically diverse lineups. It was just how it was this evening. It wasn't meant, but thank you for raising it. You're absolutely right to keep pushing those buttons, so thank you. Hello, I actually have no problem with the speaker lineup in terms of diversity. Uh, I think it should be on the merit of the quality of presentation rather than gender. Um, thank you to all. On picking up on your point, Chris, you, when you said be aware of ideology, I think the underlying idea, you all talked about trends, and you talked about how you understand trends, how you get, why, but you say be aware of it. What's your standing, like, what, what's your position on this idea that we should, uh, is ideology indeed bad? Is because I think the more we have big data or the more we have human data, the better we understand ourselves as humans and as collectives, as nations, I don't know, as Londoners. So uh, what I'm trying to, to oh, sorry, but I, I guess my question is, shall we be aware, we, uh, afraid of it, or shall we embrace it? God. Um. Good question. Um, I mean, from my perspective, I wasn't sort of um, positing some grand conspiracy, Illuminati-like kind of contrails, like, you know, that we need to fight the system. What I'm suggesting is actually a self-reflexivity, that we're all products of our environment and unconscious bias. So, um, you know, having empathy for the other perspective is something that I believe you can cultivate through mindful states through recognising the, the, your own habit patterns of mind when you meditate. So my point with, woke, with, with this kind of wakefulness, which is a kind of another version of woke, but more focused on mindfulness rather than politics, was saying let's become more aware of our own unconscious biases. And there was an article recently at The Atlantic that said how do we understand bigotry? Can we understand, can we actually break down these hardened positions and start to understand why someone would believe something? Why a so-called um, conservative who is economically liberal in the States would want to cut welfare? If we understand they genuinely think that some of them, not all of them, some of them are cynical, but some of them genuinely think that is the best way to grow the economy and trickle-down theory can work. And having that realisation helps kind of break down some of the hate and increase some empathy. So that was my perspective. I don't think you can avoid ideology, but I think you become more self-reflexive and more aware of your own biases and therefore become more harmonious in the way you interact with others on social media and offline. I'd like to ask Adam a very easy question. <laughs> How many, how many languages do you speak? Uh, I speak, well, there we go, you put me right on the spot. I could tell you I speak Spanish. I was in <laughs> Venezuela. I wasn't interviewing people like this. Hello, how's it going? You know, they wouldn't have understood a word. I, my, my Spanish has dipped since, but I speak some Spanish. I, I guess underlying the question is, do you have to understand the language in order to go and do the kind of work absolutely. you do in other... Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I spent two years in Latin America learning Spanish before I did my research. So you specialise in Latin America? Because... Yes. Okay. I did. Pre I had with my PhD research, which was some years ago. Lydia? Do you want to go first? Okay. Hey, yeah, mine was about the ethnography as well. Uh, do you have to select people appropriately so they draw out the right information for the people they're interviewing? I'm very glad you asked that question. <laughs> uh, let me think of my answer. Um, <clears throat> well, to be honest with you, it, I, so I'm working on a project right now for a confectionery brand, and they wanted to reach a different, they wanted to release a whole new product, right? But they didn't know who for, they didn't know if it was for their entire target base right now, their customer base now, and so we've, we've gone very wide, right? So, so lots of larger data, um, survey, I don't really like survey, I think it leads people too much, but what it's starting to do for me is filter down the themes that people are talking about according to perhaps demographic or age or location or, 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 um, or, or um, preferences 
to enable me to start to understand the sorts of people we need to understand more from. That's how we'd select. So if I was out doing a longer term piece of ethnography, uh, I, I'd use a snowball sample, which would be to say, hey, I'm interested in this thing. And the more I say that in coffee shops to taxi drivers, to people on the street, they'll tell me about people who do that sort of thing. So I'd maybe get invited to, let's say, say we're talking about kombucha. I'd eventually get to somebody who makes kombucha's house. They might have a kombucha party. And three people in there talked a lot about the same themes. I'd then recognize that they were the same themes. However, with ethnography, you also have to bear in mind that it's only a snapshot in time. And you'll never get the exact <laughs> representation of everyone. What you will get is a sample in time of consumers' behaviors, beliefs, cultures, and so on around that, that question. Yeah. So in your company, um, so say if it was about, uh, like if you had to go and live in someone's house for a while, yeah. then you'd presumably have to pick the researcher appropriately because they might feel it's a, open. You know, I, I'm aware. We, we could talk about this for a long time, but very quickly, and it's, it's fascinating stuff. I love it, obviously. Uh, I think I told you already, right? Um, I. Um, it's, well, it, it's mixed. So it's, it's varying opinions on that. So people say that. Um, there are some schools of thought that say people entirely removed from the culture that one's going to research is best place to understand the nuances of that culture rather than the person from the culture researching their own culture. If you're a different person in a different culture, you may notice different things that the person living there hadn't already noticed. So, so it may be that if you were, say, uh, researching uh, mother behavior in, in prenatal uh, phases, Sorry, that sounded really like I really know what I'm talking about. I don't, I'm sorry. It just came into my head. Um, then, then sending a kind of a, a mother who's had, you know, somebody who's had children might be the best person, but not always. So some people believe that entirely, others don't. I'm on the fence because I'm on stage. Okay. Right. Um, Lydia, have we got a... Um, I just I think the role of the planner in this situation is often to kind of pull all of the insights that you guys have given them and make sense of them together. And I was just wondering if you had any first thoughts on how you might work together. Mm. Lucas and George kind of touched on it, but you've got such different disciplines. How might you bring them together? It's like the Avengers. I really wanted to get a selfie really of all of us. version of the Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'd be our front man. I loved your talk. Yeah. Um, you want an answer? I've got an insight there. I mean, I think the semiotics would probably go first. And the reason I say that an egomaniac. Now, the reason I say that is because I think understand having a kind of holistic <coughs> helicopter view of, of a cultural area is really useful. I also think semiotics is a really good way of thinking about what you might not know that you think you know. Um, you know, challenging assumptions. I think it's great at um, generating hypotheses to be explored in within ethnog ethnographic research. And I've worked most closely with ethnographic research before, and I love doing those, because you kind of have culture in terms of symbolism and visual culture. You also have ritual, and you have belief, and, and the lived experience of material anthropology, how people interact with objects and with media and all that sort of stuff. It's really good. But obviously, there's also quantification now with semiotics. So I'd love to, to work with this chap and see how um, we can put some, you know, some symbols and some visual culture onto some of the, the ways in which brands grow. Um, and yeah, forensic, digital forensics, seems to be a way of putting more granularity into some broad hypotheses that a semiotic analysis could generate. So I think we've got a crack team here, crack really. Team. It's a dream I wanna, team. I just wanted to add, I, I mentioned human data, not big data. I was being completely facetious, and I really want to piss people off with that statement, to open up the conversation. Actually, human data makes sense of all of this data, and it all goes hand in hand, absolutely, at different stages. And I think that research and insight into anything has to be iterative as you go along. For planning and strategy, probably not. Probably you might do some in, in, uh, up front, but then you might test that later on. But that's, that's my opinion. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily about orders. It's all about contextualizing the information. I think that you have this, you know, certain methods achieve high amount of data, but low amount of humanity. And others are right up against that person, but you don't know them. I mean, we've done studies recently <clears throat> where we recruited runners, and then <laughs> we did uh, GPS tracking. And it turns out, like, 90% of the people we recruited were not runners. Uh, so uh, you got to, you kind of got to assemble it. I'm not necessarily, it's not like a recipe. It doesn't go in the same order every time, but more in the service of what your client wants. And then, I don't know, I'm very excited about the possibility of achieving truth. I mean, I think for a long time, when I did research, we would do like, you got some more tweets, and this emoji means they like you. But now we, uh, w when you start combining disciplines, you can really get so close, almost like you're standing over the shoulder of someone. 
and understand that, you know, like the possibility today of getting a fully clean, you know, consumer journey. You know, that was a, at least when I was coming up, that was the big dream of like really seeing that moment where the product, the advert or whatever, it penetrates through and then they're gonna make that purchase. And those are the things that I think as researchers today, we, we are within that grasp. I don't think that we had that before, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about combining stuff. You heard it first at Noisy Thinking that we were going to achieve truth. <laughs> I like Not that. with us runners, but you know, yeah. <laughs> Over here. Uh, hi there, question for Alex. Uh, yep. So I love the point about great work is worth fighting for, yeah, yeah, um, but what if you're not in the position to really fight for it? What if you're you know, the junior planner on an account, for example? Uh, do you have any tips for then? Uh, I'd say um, not, every, not every fight is a title fight, I suppose, <coughs> is what I'd say, right? You don't, you don't have to be the one that's, that's, there's almost never a single kind of argument or a single conversation that you have that makes someone go, no, I'm not going to create really mediocre work, I'm going to create great work. Um, that is achieved kind of drip by drip and kind of chip by chip. and. The best thing you can do, particularly as a, as, as a kind of junior planner, thinking back to when I was one, is to always keep on keeping some of this stuff in mind, actually. Kind of always, always, always keeping on making the case and being kind of fair and rational and sensible and always thinking about the person who's on the other side of the fight from you in terms of why it is that they're making the decision that they're making because they, want, they have a lower appetite for risk than you, because someone's going to yell at them if they lose loads of money. If you understand that, if you understand why they are where they are on the curve, you'll move them further along it faster. It won't happen, you know, it's not always a knockout fight, it won't happen overnight, but the more you can keep doing that, the more you can keep explaining creative, you know, creative necessity in business terms, the better you'll do and the less time you'll be a junior planner for. That's right. <laughs> One over here. Sorry, another question for Alex. Um, with things like normal distribution, they sort of depend on people having choice. And um, with lots of paid for search and with recommendations based on our past behavior uh, in technology, do you think we still gonna get the same sorts of normal distributions that we previously got? Oh, that's a marvelous question. I have no idea. I'm gonna go and think, think about that later and go, why did I give such a shit answer? Um, <laughs> I think, so yeah. Um, the most boring thing as a statistician is if these curves always stayed the same, uh, is, is, is kind of the first thing. And so I was thinking about the, the question that I played no part in answering, which it's so, uh, this sort of thing, maths is, help, is really good at helping you find the edges of the world as it is today. Um, but a lot of the other stuff that we've seen today is really good at helping you find the leading indicators that those curves are, are, are going to move. This is a really woolly roundabout way of saying, I think they are going to move. I don't know quite how. But also, I mean, I, I also think we have, we have a tendency to overplay the impact of novelty. So at the moment, everybody's wondering, everyone's worrying, you know, everyone at FMCG is worrying about uh, Amazon Alexa and whether it's going to kind of completely disintermediate the ability to build brands because there's something standing in between the brand and the consumer controlling their, their, their sort of choice architecture, if you like. That's the situation that FMCG brands were invented for. It's just that 100 years ago, those things were called shops, and then they were called supermarkets, and now they're called Amazon Alexa. So I think the, I, d I don't know, I think we, we kind of, we worry too much that brands are dead when actually we're, we're, with that example, we're creating an environment where brands are gonna have to fight harder than ever. You'll get more, you know, you'll get a, a longer tail and a taller top bit. I think winners, winners will take more in that environment, but that's an argument for branding rather than against it. But I think it will change the curves. But I haven't figured out how yet while I've been talking, so I'm going to have to leave it. <laughs> One over here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what's the kind of, I know you're all focused on the data and what you kind of collect on your insights. What's the coolest, two or three would want to answer, what's the coolest way you've ever seen your, uh, your data used? You know, like a service or a product or um, 
content <laughs> content's dead uh, can i jump in on that i've spoken a lot already but i just wanted to mention again that dementia project that i worked at with the nhs so they <clears throat> decided to create a, a service for patients with dementia um by changing the, uh, they, they trialed a, a service in which the community were trained about people with dementia from bus drivers to cafes to gps so they had this golden ticket and they went around and they were getting access to different places that became um that was so successful based on the research that I'd done to understand that the carers were able to help navigate the system more and it saved the healthcare system money. Uh, the, the, the coolest thing about that was that people just felt happy. That's what matters, right? You've got dementia. I mean, we can talk about campaigns and brands and whatever else, but the bottom line is about people. And they felt happy and they were okay. They got a better service as a result of it and the NHS rolled it out nationally. Uh, I don't have anything to do with charity, so uh, it's going to be inherently worse. But that's I, um, I think in terms of application, um, looking at some of the new ways in which linguistic modeling can be applied to having a more honest conversation with your audience is definitely very interesting. So obviously we only had a few minutes to show what it does, but what it really b builds is a sort of lexicon and a way of understanding as you know, as quickly as possible, what you know, some enthusiasts might might feel about something. So, what I've seen it used most often is for having conversations with your community. When a company needs to own up to something or have a very honest conversation in a way that feels genuine, mm -hmm. uh, I think that if you look at the adverts that have been disastrous, like that Pepsi advert that we all laugh at today, like it's just this complete misunderstanding of what things stand for and I think in a lot of ways again what I mean is they're just tools but with the right people it allows them to be much more effective at communicating. One more question before we wrap up. Oh, yeah. Hi, and this is a question probably for the Flamingo guys. Um, I'm really interested in trend forecasting <laughs> and futurism as sort of a... I thought you were going to say poop doping. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, What's wrong with that, Lucas? And I've recently read a really fabulous book called um, Cultural Strategy by Douglas Holt. And I guess that book kind of explores this idea of gut and intuition sort of being looked down upon as a kind of strategic discipline. I wonder what your point of view is on that and whether you think gut has a role to play within the, your, the, your discipline? I think it does, certainly, especially as you kind of build more experience within the industry, within understanding culture at large. But I think one thing that's certainly worth bearing in mind when applying gut is that you are bringing in all of these other really rich and deep tools that get you to something that is perhaps kind of just as valuable in, in getting to the truth. I think something else that's really, really important is generally, especially when you're doing global research, global kind of futures work, is being self-reflexive. So if you're not based within a certain locality, a certain geography, but you are understanding, for example, say in this position, you know, future of well-being in China, that you are engaging the right people to, to help you conduct that research. and and being particularly aware of any inherent biases that you may be applying looking through perhaps a global or a Western lens. So I think it's, I think being self-reflexive with the application of kind of gut and intuition is, is probably my answer to that question. Yeah, we totally built some Chinese linguistic modeling recently and it just is so weird when you interact with that data for the first time because it totally doesn't fall the same way and you, you kind of have to respond to it but if you don't have like a response to it then the data is just dictating and it doesn't really make any sense so yeah I think that's it I think we you can call it gut but I think what ultimately the, the likes of Douglas Holt will do and what we do is we're applying a, a kind of a cultural lens and, and an inte intelligent perspective on say for example the data so it's gut and it's feeling but it's it's rooted in kind of experience and perspective cool. thank you so good much. answer good thank you very much all of you it's fantastic Thank you to you all for coming. It's great to have such a good turnout. Let us know what you thought, as always. If you go on our site or on our event page, we've got about seven things coming up. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of them. We've got a Thinking Around Corners. We've got um, a major strategy conference in the autumn about contrarian thinking. We have a party for 50 years of planning. There's loads of stuff. We'll go along, have a look, and do come. And hope to see you at the next one. Thanks very much.